Hi, welcome to the Nottawasega Valley Conservation Authority's Fort Willow Conservation Area. Today we're going to take a tour of Fort Willow and the Minnesing Wetlands Conservation Area. Come with us and we'll show you around. So welcome to Historic Fort Willow. Walk through these gates and take yourself back 200 years to a time when soldiers, coopers, blacksmiths, indigenous people all came together to fight for the common good and survive in a pretty harsh part of Ontario back in the early 1800s. So back in the uh, early 1970s, uh, this property was owned by the Berry Chamber of Commerce. And uh, after uh, a couple of years of negotiations, it was eventually um, donated to the NVCA. Um, they, they knew that, you know, we had a land acquisition program at the time. Uh, there was there was this local knowledge uh, and the knowledge of historians that uh, there was a real historical significance of the property and so the idea was that we would acquire the land and we would protect it uh, because it's being um, bordering the menacing wetlands obviously uh, there's there's an ecological perspective as well so at the end of the day we acquired I think it's about uh, 10 acres and uh, yeah, we, we just managed it as a, uh, a natural area for many, many years. 20 years after acquiring it, uh, we were approached by a group of uh, retired gentlemen that uh, had this vision of um, rekindling the sparks of historic Fort Willow. Um, it, you know, word was out then uh, quite broadly that um, this was a very strategic military depot during the War of 1812. And so their mission was to, uh, you know, res resurrect this place. Um, it was basically uh, an overgrown cow pasture, a lot of young saplings, poplar and whatnot. So it didn't look anything like you see it today. It was, um, you know, a, a wood lot that um, required a lot of work and uh, they did that. It took, it was 10 years. Their, their project took them, uh, all volunteer, uh, donated materials, etc. cetera. Um, they did a lot of work at the, um, Simcoe County Museum in the archives. They looked at a lot of the old archaeological um, uh, records and uh, we brought in a surveyor and um, we put in these timbers. We didn't want to put in any buildings because it's out in the middle of nowhere and, and vandalism is, is a problem as uh, our viewers will know. And um, so we just put in these outlines and just gives people uh, an idea of what life used to be here. You know, we've got the, the block house, the blacksmiths, the, the stables the cookhouse, etc. So that that's it's, it's just kind of grown from there where we now have accessible trails and uh, it's it's just it's it's just really started to take on a life of its own. The palisade, I mean this is what obviously would a, a palisade around a, a fort back in the day would have looked like. Uh, the jury is still out on whether or not there actually was a palisade here um, but Wilford Drury, no pun intended, his his, his drawings uh, or notes did show a some type of a palisade around the fort encampment, and so the volunteers took it upon themselves to put in this 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 lovely uh, wooden structure that really gives you that feeling of uh, hey this is you know we're, we've really stepped back in time here I mean there are a lot of forts in Canada that look like this, and so that's why we've uh, we've erected this one. The original group that uh, came on site was, they, they called themselves the Fort Willow Improvement Group. And they were a, gr a group of retired farmers, basically, that just brought this place back to life the way you see it now. So 10 years after they, uh, after they finished their project, we then morphed into a group called Friends of Historic Fort Willow. This group is a different makeup. They're largely all reenactors, indigenous people, soldiers in, from the War of 1812, sailors, etc. They love to come here in full costume and they, they really bring a lot of color to the property. So that's worked well for us. You know, we have a festival each year called the Festival at Fort Willow where we'll see a thousand people coming through here on uh, any given Saturday and uh, just educating the public on life during uh, the early 1800s and during wartime etc. So yeah, it's, uh, it's worked out well. Two different, two different dynamics uh, these groups were and um, it's, been, it's been a challenge but very interesting, very rewarding to work with both of them. 
Hi there, I'm Trevor Carter. I'm a high school teacher at St. Joseph's High School in Barrie, but I'm also a licensed archeologist with the Ministry of Tourism and Culture and Sport. And today we're here at Fort Willow, War of 1812 reconstructed archeological site, a real archeological site. And I bring my students from grade 12 out here for um, annual and semi-annual excavations here at Fort Willow for actual digs um, here at the fort. The process of excavating is kind of surprising to students sometimes. Maybe they expect to get a shovel and dig right in, but we're very meticulous. We're very careful in how we excavate. We use a trowel, for example, this small tool here. And some of the students will dig deeper than themselves, almost five or six feet down, just scraping. One small scrape at a time. We don't want to miss any artifacts. It's not like you see on TV or on um, Indiana Jones or in a movie where you're finding really big artifacts. Usually the bulk of what we find are very, very small items. But thanks to all these little items that we find, we can slowly put back together the story of Fort Willow. It's almost like a, um, uh, a crime scene or, or a detective story where little small clues can lead to a full story. That's what we do here. It's a very slow process, but bit by bit, here we are at a reconstructed site based mostly on archaeological finds. What you see behind me here are these outlines on the ground. These are the outlines of buildings that were found archaeologically from a previous archaeologist in 1959 who came here, Wilfred Jury. But the whole area is all reconstructed thanks to archaeology. These buildings would have been supply centers. This fort was built for supplies coming up from Toronto, from York, just in case of any attack from the Americans, we could get some supplies around the Great Lakes using this area here. So it's very important for the War of 1812 that this place be here for these supplies. But the building you see behind us here, that's all based, the outlines are all based on archeological work. These particular buildings I'm standing next to, we think were the officers' quarters. The officers were the upper class members of the, of the military, and these buildings were made for them. Now, why do we think so? We think this, first of all, the archeologist in 1959 believed this because of the artifacts he had found, but we have one problem. The archeologist from that time didn't leave any reports for us to investigate why he thinks this is the officer's quarter. So one of the reasons we're back here with my students from St. Joseph's High School, the grade 12 students, they get credit for this course. We come here and we excavate to try to see if we can confirm what the previous archaeologist found. We're very lucky. He didn't excavate everything. There's lots for us to find. We get an average of about two or 3,000 artifacts every year. And looking at those artifacts and where they're found, we can say, yes, this actually is the officer's quarters, or maybe not. In this case, we did find evidence for the officer's quarters. The artifacts here support this conclusion. Some of the things we have found, for example, um, parts of the weapons from the soldiers. This is part of a musket. It's called a gun flint and it makes the spark that ignites your gunpowder and then fires your weapon. These were found in this area where the officers you would expect them to be with their weapons. We find that here. What comes out of the gun after you fire it out of the musket? A lead ball. And this is an actual artifact that we found here. This is a lead musket ball. It's made of lead. It's very heavy. It's too bad you couldn't, couldn't touch it yourself. You'd see it's very heavy. Um, we have found larger projectiles as well, not just lead balls from the muskets or the pistols. We've also found something called grape shot. I wish I had it here for you. It's much larger, about the size of a very, very large grape. They would put these in a net or a thin tin can, put it into a cannon and fire it. And when you fire the cannon, the net tears apart or the can breaks apart. And these large grape sized metal balls fly in every direction. So you can take out lots of people if there's an invading force. You can take out a lot of people with that in one shot. We found that here too. So evidence for the military is very very, very common place here that we find for the military presence. We also find, this will be very difficult to see, we also find buttons. The uniform buttons the soldiers wore usually told you the regiment that they were part of. In this case here, it's the, we found a button here in 2007 from the 68th Regiment, which we know was stationed in Upper Canada after the War of 1812. But this site continued to ha have a military presence even after the War of 1812 was over, and this particular regiment spent time up in Petitanguishene as well. The lead musket balls that, the, that we find here, sometimes they're pre-made, but often the soldiers made their own. 
And so what do we find here at the fort? Evidence for them making their own musket balls. This strange looking little blob here is actually melted lead. The soldiers would melt lead over a campfire and pour it into a mold to make their own musket balls. And we have evidence of that here as well. So we find the complete musket balls and the evidence of manufacture. All that makes sense for a military site and for the officer's quarters. So how would we know if this is the officer's quarters or a soldier's area? Just finding musket balls and pieces of weapons isn't enough. We have to have, find something we can use to compare the two people. We know the officers are upper class. They're going to be able to afford more expensive things than the average soldier. And one of the key things that can tell you someone's wealth at that time in the early 1800s is the kind of ceramic they eat off of. Today you might look at someone's car, look at their SUV or a, a small compact car to get an idea of how wealthy someone might be. Back then it was quite often ceramic. This ceramic here in this photograph, this is a, it's a piece of a plate, a, di a dinner plate. This was found here in the officer's quarters and you can see the fine detail of the, the woman and her dress in this. This was not hand painted. This was made in a essentially a printing process. It was an industrial method of making, mass producing these types of plates. These were more expensive, believe it or not, than this type of ceramic here. It's hard to see what you're looking at here, but it's hand-painted flowers on some ceramic. Today, if you ask, uh, ask people who are out to buy some ceramic for their home, they'll want hand-painted. They'll think that's beautiful. This is exactly what I want to have for my home. It's, it's much more expensive to buy hand-painted ceramic. Not the case back then. Hand-painted was viewed as cheap ceramic. This is what we would tend to find more in the soldiers area. The officers wanted this new idea, this printed ceramic, and that's what you see here. We found more of this in the officers area. Far across the archaeological site is the soldiers area. They stayed pretty far away from where the officers were, very distinct regions. And we found a lot more hand-painted ceramic in the soldiers area. So using just ceramics, comparing the types that we're finding, we can confirm what the previous archaeologists thought, that this was the officers area and not a place for the lower class soldier. So because the Fort Willow is a historic site, we try to uh, commemorate that with some of the construction projects we do here. Um, and a good, great example of that is this beam work we've done here to hold up a cauldron. Um, we try to, both in the materials we use here and in the construction methods, uh, keep things as traditional and historically as we can. So for instance, with this beam work here, we've actually done traditional wood joinery. Um, an example of that would be a mortise and tenon joint. So what a mortise and tenon is, is at the top of this beam here, you have what has been notched down to a smaller size, and that's the tenon. And then the tenon fits inside of a notch made the same size in the top beam, so they fit together nicely. And then you would drill through and put a wood dowel to hold it all together. Now once that dowel is put in place, that will never move and it is a solid uh, form of wood joinery. So that's actually what we've done up here. So this great big beam here goes up inside of that beam there and is held together with strictly with dowels and wood so we are not using any um, you know modern hardware we are doing things the way they would have built things back in the day uh, another feature of this would be the fact that when you buy lumber these days it all comes perfectly smooth rounded off edges all milled properly well when the things would have been built they would have been using axes all by hand uh, would have been rough edges and everything so what we do is we take axes or we take planers, things like that when a project is done and we try to rough up the beams to kind of make it look more historically accurate. Um, another thing we sometimes have to do, just for safety purposes, we will have to use some modern day uh, technologies or materials. For instance, this one is actually sitting on concrete bases. Uh, when we do any digging in the, in the historic Fort Willow, we always make sure to save all of the dirt. We always dig by hand to make sure that we are not disturbing the soil as much as possible. Anything that comes out of the ground is actually safe for our archaeologists to sift through to see if there's any artifacts within that. So we try to have as low of uh, an impact on the ground as possible when we are constructing things. Um, we all, when we do have to use modern day uh, materials and construction methods, uh, we do try to hide that as much as possible when we are done. So for instance, you'll notice here we have what it looks like wood dowels holding these in. In fact, what we had to do here was use great big lags in behind here uh, and a few screws as well inlaid here to hold it all together. We try to hide all of that with some wood dowel after the fact so that it's not visible to the public. 
So just as important as uh, using building me methods to keep things historically accurate, it's actually choosing the materials themselves can be just as important. So an example here would be uh, a shed here that we have actual sh cedar shake shingles on as the material for the roofing. Uh, modern day things like asphalt shingles, metal roofing weren't used back in the day. So this is uh, a, a way of keeping things historically accurate uh, around the property. Another way we try to keep the, uh, the construction projects uh, low impact on the property is actually the way we build our trails here. So for instance, you'll see I'm standing in a low lying spot that's low elevation uh, and it's basically undisturbed ground here. Well, right around me is our trail system and you'll notice as I move forward, I'm coming up. It's in this elevated trail system. The reason we do this is on an average property, all we would do is go around with some heavy machinery, um, chew up what the old trail material is, uh, and then try and smooth it back out where in here we did not want to disturb the ground beneath the trail itself So we actually built it up with limestone screenings as opposed to disturbing the ground underneath The Fort Willow Conservation Area is located just up the hill from menacing wetlands Historically people would have transported goods and materials from Lake Simcoe through Fort Willow down the Nottawasaga River and into Georgian Bay So back uh, after the war uh, of 1812 had ended, um, patriots or veterans of the uh, of that war coming back to Canada, they were given plots of land, and uh, it wasn't uh, real prime land. Uh, a lot of it was in the middle of uh, what was known as menacing swamp. So um, what uh, started was a small community, uh, actually named McKinnon Settlement, and it's actually within the southwestern area of menacing and uh, it's not not there any longer but there was a kind of a i guess you'd call it a thriving little agricultural community back in the 1900s 1910 1920 type thing and um it wasn't sustainable, obviously, uh, during the, the floods, which were they can be extreme down in Minnesota. We'll, we'll see waters, you know, elevating a couple of meters minimum. Uh, a lot of these farmers, they would have to take their livestock to the to the top floor of the barn. They'd have to take their furniture to the top floor in the house, and that, that was kind of life as it was in McKinnon Settlement. About 40 years ago, 45 years ago, um, NVCA and Nature Conservancy Canada entered into a into a partnership where lands were uh, purchased and or acquired through donation uh, within Minnesing Wetlands. This is one of the longer uh, land acquisition partnerships uh, that either agencies have taken part in and uh, of the wetlands uh, 13,000 acres um, we now uh, own and manage 12,000 acres so it's been a real success story and you know some of these were parcels of 20 acres, parcels of 100 acres 3,000 acres, whatever the case may be. It's all been kind of uh, um, put together and, uh, and, and it's now there for the um, recreation and uh, use by the general public, which sees a, a lot of, of visitors. So we're standing just um, on the edge of uh, the Lake Payette shoreline. Uh, down behind me, uh, we, we dropped considerably down to Menacing Wetlands and there are various uh, little ecosystems throughout this entire wetland. It's, it's very interesting in where you're seeing, because it's a, um, a, a waterfall staging area, we'll see all kinds of waterfalls. Sometimes the skies are black with ducks and geese, swans, and um, now we have eagle, the uh, bald eagles. Uh, they're, they're pretty common. So beyond the birds, uh, you're seeing a lot of uh, dead silver maple forest. It's almost um, prehistoric in some ways, especially when you're, you're going through and, and you'll see 20 or 30 uh, great blue herons that look like pterodactyls sometimes as you're, uh, as you're cruising through the wetland. So that, that's a highlight of the spring tours. And uh, any other time of year, obviously the, the, the leaves changing this time of year, that's very popular with, with our visitors. And then throughout the summer, I mean, we have the Mad, we have the Willow Creek, and then we have the Nautilus Saga. So there's, there's lots of opportunity for, for different waterways to travel on. The wetland is made up of uh, various different types of, uh, of wetland. You know, we, we've got our fens, we've got the uh, a kind of a, a boreal forest, we've got our Carolinian forest. It's, it's a real, mix up of different ecotypes uh, or ecosystems and um, that has really brought out the interest from scientists, uh, universities and obviously uh, people just wanting to come and, and see what's, what's to offer. 
Hello, my name is Vanessa Kennedy and I am from Wissaxian First Nation and I am here to talk about um, the role that First Nations people played in the War of 1812 and also the Nine Mile Portage. Uh, so the Nine Mile Portage would have been used by First Nations um, a long time ago before War of 1812 or even before um, the fur trade happened. The only way to travel back in the day was a uh, canoe and you had to find portage see, to get to the next waterway. So um, Indigenous people would have traveled this way from Lake Simcoe um, up this way and then obviously to the next um, waterway that they could get to. Again, traveling further up north to the next Great Lake. Um, and this was traveled heavily by um, the um, Three Fires Confederacy, which was the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the, the Odawa. Also by the Wendat pre-Iroquois Confederacy. Again, they would have they would have traveled this road as well. So along this trade um, route, things would have been traded um, pre-contact, and the things that would have been traded pre-contact between First Nations people were shells. Shells were very revered. Um, so this large shell is an abalone shell, and it comes from the West Coast. And with that would have been shards of shells, which is abalone as well, again, from the west coast. It would have made its way through here at some point in time. Um, other shells that would have been collected um, along the way, again, you could have found them um, in and around this area. Um, dentillium would have been traded as well. Again, that was um, a shell that was used on um, a lot of uh, traditional regalia from indigenous people. Um, Another thing that would have been traded was um, tobacco. Tobacco was very, um, a very huge commodity in trade um, pre-contact. Um, and this is um, obviously tobacco, not commercial tobacco today. <laughs> um, sage also would have been traded. Um, this sage comes from all the way from California. So this is what they call white buffalo sage. Again, that would have been traded down in this area. Another hot commodity was um, this actual root, which is called bear root, and it's actually grown in the Appalachians. So it would have come all the way down from the Appalachians, all the way up this way. And it would have made this, its way up this way, further up, further north. Um, this was a, a very sought after medicine was bear root. And along this area, I have not walked in the Nine Mile Portage myself, but um, <laughs> I would assume there would have been tree markers um, along the way, again, marking the, the territory. Um, tree markers were used on many footpaths. Um, again, it, it was a tree marker that would show you if you were gonna turn left or right. Tree marker was a young sapling usually, and it was tied down. And if it was tied to the left, it means you took the left. And if it was tied down to the right, you took the right trail. Sometimes you came to a fork. They were both tied down, so you could either go right or left. If you knew the footpath, then you obviously knew which way to go. Um, but a lot of the times you used guides. Um, again, after when uh, contact happened, um, a lot of indigenous people were guides. So they took um, fur traders up, up this route and that's how they would find their way through is through tree, uh, tree markers um, along the footpaths. Welcome everyone to the Willow Creek Canoe Corral. This is on the eastern end of the Minnesing wetlands and uh, one of the main access points for some of the recreation activities here in uh, the wetlands. Um, Minnesing wetlands, it's, it's fed by several different rivers and tributaries, creeks, uh, but one of the main ones is the Nottawasauga River, of course. Uh, it starts over near Orange, Orangeville and then sort of wiggles its way through the center of our watershed and then exits the wetlands near Edenvale and then wiggles its way out towards um, Wasega Beach and into Georgian Bay. The Minnesing Wetlands is one of our most important pieces of flood control infrastructure that we have um, available to us. It uh, being in the center of our watershed and one of the main drain points for all the tributaries, it collects and stores and slowly releases a whole ton of our water that we, we get and without it a lot of places would be underwater. Because this spot here has so much changing water levels, it could be up to eight feet depending on uh, how much snowpack and spring melt and all that sort of stuff. It creates all of these different areas that are sort of untouched by, by us humans and it's just an open natural so spot for all of these creatures and everything to make their homes. Menacing wetlands, it's, it's an extremely sort of changing environment uh, as far as water level goes um, and because of that it's, it's it's kind of a place where we need to focus on uh, managing passively 
So we manage it for passive recreation, um, for things like snowshoeing, uh, cross-country skiing in the wintertime, and in the summertime, canoeing and kayaking. Uh, we have a couple small hiking trails um, at the southern end, uh, near what we call the Lookout Tower, and here at the Canoe Corral, uh, which we are only able to mow for a good part of the year, but not all year. Uh, early spring, often the trails are flooded, and usually in the late fall, once we start to get some more rain, they'll flood again and we kind of have to leave them for the year. There were very few trees around this bird tower, uh, meadowy area, uh, but you had to have a really good set of binoculars to be able to see and actually watch the birds. Uh, so this was a bit of a rehabilitation. This spot where our tower is um, was a farm at one point that uh, people had to give up on um, and I think donated to us. Uh, but this was a field and it would have been flooded every year. We ended up bringing in some larger equipment, dug some holes and now we have a few bird watching ponds. We brought the wetlands to the tower. The, the tricky things about the menacing wetlands is that with our fluctuating water levels, um, the, the creek path and we essentially end up with almost a lake setting further down the creek here. It, it becomes a spot where people can get lost really easily. Uh, so we always recommend that you, you come well prepared with a plan because you don't want to be the person that runs out of water or can't paddle back against the current or just didn't even bring a map or a compass to begin with or stays out too late because it turns into a really uh, expensive uh, rescue operation between uh, fire crew and helicopters and boats going down the creek. It, it's just a bill you don't want to have to pay at the end of the day of a nice canoe ride. We offer hunting on our properties as part of a recreational option. Uh, mainly in the menacing wetlands. Some of the main benefits uh, for hunting is um, social aspect, um, you know, physical activity, um, ov overall mental health. I see a lot of um, parents bringing out their kids um, and you know, sometimes I'll, I'll come across families uh, of three generations that have been hunting in the menacing wetlands their whole lives. So it's uh, kind of nice to see um, grandparents and parents passing it down to, uh, to their kids. The hunters are stewards of the land. They provide eyes and ears uh, for us um, because we don't have the opportunity of being out in menacing all the time. So the uh, the hunters do provide us with a lot of information um, that's useful. Sometimes they report um, animals that aren't uh, normally seen. Uh, so we've had reports of, of uh, moose in the menacing wetland, which is uh, pretty far south for, for moose. Um, a lot of times they'll report um, illegal activity and that allows us to, to go out and uh, deal with it appropriately. We offer 100 permits to resident and non-resident people for our watershed. Uh, the main reason why we, we cap it off at 100 is because of harvest numbers and uh, to keep basically the impact uh, to, a, to a minimum uh, in, in menacing. When they are out on our property though, they, um, you know, obviously they have to abide by MNR rules and regulations in regards to, uh, to licensing and tagging. Um, but, you know, we also incorporate some of our own rules while they're out on our properties uh, to keep impact uh, to a minimum. Part of the Conservation Authorities Act, um, you know, there's no removal, destruction, or anything like that of any plant, animal, and whatnot. So that, that's sort of written in our rules, but I mean, um, uh, we make that aware to the hunters when they come in and get their permit. And uh, some of the rules obviously are like, you know, no ATVing, um, you know, for, for pulling your, your animal out. Uh, 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 another big one that we don't promote is, is any vegetation trimming, like, um, you know, for sight lines or shooting lanes or anything like that. So um, hunting uh, on our properties, the impact is kept to a minimum. Also, we, uh, we don't allow 
allow people to build any uh, permanent tree stands. So we only allow temporary um, uh, basically ladder tree stands that have to be removed after hunting season and uh, th that also uh, keeps uh, impact to a minimum. The non-permanent tree stands, like the ladder stands that we allow, um, essentially are you know ratchet strapped to uh, the tree. And uh, once um, hunting season's over, uh, the uh, the hunters to remove them um, afterwards. So there's no or little impact at all. The Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority uses an online payment system called the McKay Pay app. Visitors to our conservation authorities can use the McKay system to pay remotely at all of our conservation areas. It's important for our guests to pay for parking, to help with trail maintenance, infrastructure development, and help maintain our conservation areas. Thank you for joining our conservation area tour. We hope you enjoyed it. We look forward to having you out and enjoying our trails someday soon.